Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Talk with the Titans, live from London, UK, all the way to the US of A and worldwide. I'm your host, Callum L, and this is Talk with the Titans. You know what? Tonight's show, we've got the living legend himself in the studios, Dr. Charles Finch. Greetings to you, Dr. Charles Finch. Thank you very much. Uh, my children would laugh uproariously to know that I'm a living legend. So uh, uh, I'm going to tell them that, and I'll get a good laugh from them about that. <laughs> I love that. But, uh, but thank you for having me on. Definitely, definitely. And for those of you who don't know who um, you know, Dr. Charles Finch is, he's been around uh, with the greats such as Ivan Van Sertema, uh, Dr. Ben Yocanan, uh, Anthony Browder. You know what, the list goes on actually. You know what, furthermore, let me not even say any more. Dr. Charles Finch, could you please give us a brief bio of all of your achievements and the things that you've done? Well, I guess I could say uh, it's hard to know where to start, but I am... Um, a physician, a doctor by training and by profession, still working in the medical profession. Married with seven children and eight grandchildren. I always like to mention that. I have been, uh, li I like to say that <clears throat> I had to create a private university in which I was both pupil and professor beginning in 1971, in which I uh, started uh, a systematic and show continuous study that goes to this very day into the origins and sources of African history and culture. Why? Uh, because I was, I was not satisfied with the idea that uh, the history of people of African descent, especially in the diaspora, begins merely 500 years ago. Uh, and then I came across a book that was kind of my road to Damascus. That was a Damascus moment. That was uh, World's Great Men of Color by J.A. Rogers, which I'm sure many of your audience are, are familiar with. He was actually from Jamaica, as you know, originally. And uh, that, as I said, set me on a path uh, because what I would do is I would go and read his sources and then read the sources of his sources. And for 10 years, from 1971 to 1981, I was kind of doing what I thought was a lonely labor. And as I say, I was uh, uh, getting my medical training. I am a family physician by training, uh, living now in Atlanta, Georgia. But in 1981, I picked up a book, a book, it was actually a, a journal by Ivan Van Sertema called The Journal of African Civilizations. That was another revelation, although I, I, it was actually a second revelation because I had read his book, They Came Before Columbus, a, a kind of landmark book for many of you, as you know, and kind of established his reputation uh, as a scholar of, uh, uh, of, of the first rank. And I actually wrote him a letter after having read the Journal of African Civilizations. Now, I don't know how he got my number. Maybe I put it on there. But a week after I sent that letter, a um, call came to me, and it says, this is Ivan Van Sertima. And I almost dropped the telephone. <laughs> I couldn't imagine. Uh, that was just unimaginable, un totally unexpected. Uh, we got it. He said he had read my letter. He was very impressed by it. And at the end of it, he wanted me to actually write an article on the uh, history of uh, blacks in medicine. And that led to, uh, what did I say? I said, yes, of course. Uh, and that led to an article called The African Background of Medical Science, the first uh, article I ever published in the Journal of African Civilizations, edited by Van Sertima. And in the end, I would publish eight articles by Van Sertima. And that also started my, later on, started my speaking career. Um, and I continued to publish, continued to speak. And uh, in 1983, I actually met Sheikh Anta Jope in Senegal. And I had four more meetings with him, including one in London, interestingly enough, in 1985. Came to London because he was invited to London by Amon a Sabah's account of Karnak House. And I actually flew all the way to London to meet him and to invite him to uh, uh, Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, where he got his only, can you imagine this, his only uh, honorary degree ever given to him by an institution of higher learning. He was there for King Week. Uh, and he met all of the, you know, the major figures in the community for a, a solid week. Um, in any case, that was also another landmark in my life. And um, uh, anyway, th that continued, and I, I, I remained friendly with Ivan Van Sertima. Unfortunately, uh, Sheikh Anta died a year later, uh, and then I eventually uh, got to the place where I, uh, uh, oh, no, I know what happened. Simone, uh, Amon Sabah Zakana collected uh, uh, eight of my essays into a book called The African Background of, uh, of uh, Medical Science. And that was seven or eight essays there. That was my first book published under my name. 
And then a year, maybe two years later, I published another book called Echoes of the Old Dark Land, Themes from the African Eden. Then in 1998, my final, my most recent book called The Star of Deep Beginnings, a Genesis of African Science and Technology. Also, by that time, I was getting, even though I was still a physician and still practicing, still working at the Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, uh, and by the way, I had been traveling to London at least three, maybe four times. Uh, the last time, I think, it was 1991, also to Egypt, ten times to Egypt. Um, then published uh, the um, uh, Star of Deep Beginnings, the Genesis of African Science Technology in 1998. Um, and, but I also got involved, deeply involved in African spirituality, traditional African spirituality, first in Senegal and then in Togo. Um, and so it has continued. Uh, what can I say? There's more that could be said. As I said, uh, my children grew up, started marrying, started having grandchildren, much to my, um, the delight of me and my wife. And um, here we are. And then Amunet uh, got in touch with me. Amunet Hall, as I never knew her name was Hall until recently, um, uh, got in touch with me and, asked, and invited me to come back to uh, the UK for the first time in about 25 years. So um, that is a synopsis of kind of where I've been and where I am right now. Wow. Wow. Absolutely wow. amazing. Wow. Absolutely um, amazing. Um, and there's a slight echo in the background, but we're going to ride through, through all of that. Um, if it's possible, uh, could everybody just mute their mics at this, at this present moment in time? Because uh, there is a minor feedback. Yes. So, um, so everybody who's watching live right now, could you please, please, please uh, share this link as much as you can. Let everybody know that the living legend himself, uh, Dr. Charles Finch, is actually with us right now. And uh, he's going to go through a plethora, a plethora of information tonight. So um, please share the link and let everybody know that we're live. Uh, Dr. Finch is here with us right now. Um, so, you know what, we've, we've got literally a jam-packed show. Um, I know, Dr. Finch, we've got, um, you know, you've got some information that you want to present to us uh, concerning the African origins of science, uh, the origins of, of culture, which is Africa. Um, you know, we're going to talk about the cosmic shift, the procession, uh, you know, what, the uh, equinox, that's, that's literally coming up right about now. Um, so, yeah, if you could just give us a nice overview of all of that information, and then we're going to get right into the uh, the grit of the presentation for today. I uh, uh, like Sheikh Anta Job and others. I uh, follow or I adhere to the bioanthropological view of human evolution and human appearance on this planet. You know, other people take issue with that, but I do not. And having done so, we know that what we call Homo sapiens sapiens, that is, mo anatomically modern human beings, first appear on this planet as such. The, people exactly like you and me, 300,000 years ago. Where? Just where you might expect. Africa. Africa first. And for 200,000 years, they never left Africa. So that, the, that, so that the history of humanity for the first 200,000 years of its existence is the history of humanity in Africa. And there's no evidence that they left Africa until about 90,000 years ago. Okay, But even when they left Africa, they, they, they left Africa as black people. That didn't change, by the way, until about 40,000 years ago when a group of them got isolated behind the glaciers uh, up in uh, Europe and Central Asia and underwent adaptations that produced what we call the Caucasoid. But I don't have time to go into that in depth and detail except to say uh, as soon as human beings appeared on this planet, they started the process of creating human culture. That started 300,000 years ago, also in Africa. So humanity and human culture begins there first. What is the highest phase of human culture? It's, human, it's what we call civilization. That, too, uh, appears first in Africa. Now, your chronologies that you will read in your standard histories, well, they may or may not have anything to do with reality, okay? Nonetheless, when we start talking about civilization that we can actually pinpoint and touch and have some tangible re reference uh, to, we have to go to Northeast Africa in the lands of Kemet and Kush that is Egypt and in, in Ethiopia, all right? But even the people from what we call Kemet or e Egypt, let alone Ethiopia, they, their origins can be found in the, what do you want to call it, the Great Lakes regions of Africa, what is now Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, uh, Tanzania, that area. How do we know this? Recently there's been Y chromosome studies, you know, bio, bio, um, the 
Uh, molecular biology has done a lot to give us historical information. And one thing that it has told us in the last year or so is that the Y chromosomes of present-day Ugandans is exactly the same as 18th dynasty Egyptians. So those people could have not had to have come in terms of their ancestry from where? Inner Africa. You know, that was, that's been a huge debate over the last, uh, what, almost 200 years, although Sheikh Anta Jope just uh, kind of laid that debate to rest. But the point is, there's no, there's, there's no more, there's no further argue, there's no further debate available. When we talk about the people of ancient Egypt, the pyramid builders, the, the builders of Karnak, the founders of civilization, beginning anywhere from 10 to 12,000 years ago, we were talking about black African people who come from the inner part of Africa, period, end of statement. There is no argument about that, and if there's anybody in uh, the UK who wants to confront me about that, I'd be happy to have that argument, love to have that argument. Blow them away without even trying, but okay. Uh, in America, nobody confronts us who are making that argument, at least not in person, not in per face to face. Now, if we're talking about the highest phases of human culture, we're also talking about every aspect of that culture, art, architect, science, and engineering. And so, and this is one of, going to be one of the topics that I discuss, is how does science, technology, mathematics originate first in, in Africa? Now, we're not just talking about Egypt or Kemet. Okay, that is one of the, that's, that's the highest expression of, of African civiliz culture and civilization, but it wasn't, but it also came out of Kush. But we don't know that enough about Kush or Ethiopia. Why? Because compared to Ethiopia, uh, excuse me, compared to Egypt, Archaeologists have pretty much ignored the uh, Kush, pretty much, and we don't have a good, we don't have as much information about Kush, but we know, and the the Kushites themselves, the Kushites themselves told Diodorus about uh, 100 or 200 BC, he says, well, Egypt came from us, and the Egyptians didn't contradict that because they knew it was true. Okay, so when you're talking about Kemet, you're also talking about Kush, okay, mm -hmm. or what people today call Ethiopia. Right? Ethiopia is a late term; it means it's a word that means sunburnt, but the people at that time didn't call themselves Ethiopia. That's what the Greeks called them, all right? And we're going to touch on that, uh, science, science and civilization in ancient Northeast Africa, how it emerged there, how what we think of as our religious and philosophical and mythological concepts emerged there, how the civilization of modern times with its architecture, its engineering, emerged there first. So what we can say, therefore, is that Northeast Africa taught civilization to the world. And uh, they didn't just stay there, by the way. They, they, there's evidence that they moved out into the rest of the world, and that's a whole other discussion. Ivan Van Sertima is the one who brought that discussion to, what is the word, into, uh, into prominence, into scholarly prominence, and there are others who have done that work. Um, so um, that, I, again, is just... Uh, uh, when we're talking about the beginning of civilization, we're talking Africa. And not just, again, not just Northeast Africa, because they look toward inner Africa for their sources and their origins. Their, who, where was their parentage from? Inner Africa. I mean, it makes sense, right? If humanity comes from there, human culture comes from there, it only makes sense that civilization, as we understand it today, also comes from there. Um, so you know what? I need to ask you some questions actually, because I just realized you know on on talk with the Titans we've started a new thing where we have a Titans uh, quick fire round of top ten questions, but I don't think we have enough time because I know how jam packed this show is going to be. So I'm going to ask you a few questions, okay? So I think I might ask you about four or five questions, quick questions. Okay. You know. What? You, you, you made some uh, statements about um, you know what, culture and science and technology in Egypt and Kush. So I want to know, are you telling me that there was no aliens, no extraterrestrial involvement in uh, building and creating this advanced society known as ancient Egypt and the pyramids? <laughs> let, me, let, me say this. Let, me, let me get on both sides of this argument in one way. Uh, I have met I have met uh, 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 Kredo Mutwa, who is a uh, Senussi from South Africa, or Sangoma, and he says yes, there is such things. He he, the, there is such things of what we people call extraterrestrial visitations to the planet Earth. But to insist that it had to be them who created the the civilization 
is just one way of getting around the uncomfortable fact, the inadmissible fact that civilization and its and its edifices were created by were the product of the of the thought and the skill and the historical and cultural evolution of black people, black African people. All right, um, so that uh, it's an absurd idea. But the aliens came down, oh, and why should they? I mean, why, why, why should they come down and do all that stuff that they say aliens did? What, why, why is that necessary for that to happen? Why is that even a necessary explanation, except to remove the credit for creating this civilization away from black people? They don't come. They don't go to China and say that the Chinese civilization was created by aliens. They don't go to India and say the Indian Hindu civilization was created by aliens. They don't go anywhere else except Africa to just talk about how the aliens were the ones that created civilization. But that doesn't mean that I'm against the idea that um, beings from other, other worlds outside may have made uh, uh, visits here. Okay? I'm not against that idea. But, I am, but what I just flatly reject is the idea that they came here and found a civilization. I mean, because you ask your question, you, again, you ask the question, why should they? Why would they? Where are they? Whatever, the, well, you know, what, the, they're always talking about evidence for this and evidence for that. Aside from, uh, aside from this useless speculation, what other evidence do you have that that could have, that could have or would have happened? Mm, excellent. And you know what? Another um, great contention, which um, is currently surfacing within inside of uh, the community as a whole, is um, you know the idea of Sumerians and the Egyptians, which. <laughs> You know, did the Sumerians, uh, you know, influence and create the Egyptian uh, civilization, or was it the Egyptians that predated, um, you know, what Sumerian culture and lent its uh, artifacts? Uh, there, there, and there are so many ways. There are so many ways to destroy that argument. There's mm -hmm. a man named Rollins, uh, an Egyptologist from the 19th century. You know, he said, you know, he said the Sumerians came from on the basis of their uh, um, linguistic similarities. He says they, the Sumer, original Sumerians were Kushites. Rawlinson said that, and he he had that's in his book, and he goes on to demonstrate that. That's number one. The second thing is so they say you can you can say the Sumerians um, started their civilization about 4200 BC. All right. Well, we know that the beginnings of the Assyrian calendar that was first developed in Egypt couldn't have been any later than, let me see, 4260 BC, because it's based on the cycle of Sirius, okay? Um, and that's number one. And then there's uh, the work by a man named uh, Robert Boval and his collaborators looking at the Sphinx yeah. and the orientation of the Sphinx. And he says, when you look at the Sphinx, it is oriented to a uh, the alpha star in the... Um, in the uh, constellation of Leo. And it's oriented to that alpha star when Leo was rising at the equinox 10,500 BC. So if you can create a sphinx 10,500 BC, that means the civilization was in place to do so. The, the people of Egypt themselves um, uh, uh, trace their, civiliza their civilization back it's like 36,000 years. So um, there's just um, that's the other reason why there has been this systematic attempt to downdate the beginning of the first dynasty. So in other words, whenever you read any history of Egypt, they talk about the first dynasty beginning at 3200, 3100 BC. That's one of the other falsehoods and falsifications and frauds perpetrated about the history of ancient Kemet and Kush. There's no way it would have started that late. And um, the, uh, there were some Egyptologists who themselves, Petri being one, Budge being another, Bruce being another, who never accepted such low dates. And that was first started by um, a man named Breasthead in 1905, who started the process of downdating the uh, chronology of ancient Egypt. So when you start looking at these things and all the different, you, you start bringing all the different factors together, the idea that Sumeria gave rise to Egypt is, is ludicrous, it's laughable. Uh, and in fact, if you believe Rawlinson, Rawlinson says Sumeria, the Sumerians were Kushites. 
You know what they call themselves? This is the name they had for themselves. Blackheads. That's right. This is what his marriage called themselves. Blackheads. Not black hair. Blackheads. Mm. I say to you, therefore, I, I rest my case. Excellent. And uh, there's even... Ad Rollins Correct. They were Kushites. They were Kushites. And there's even further work done uh, that uh, links them or shows uh, from a linguistic uh, point of view that they were uh, Bantu speakers. I believe uh, they were... Uh, yep. Is that correct? They, they were Bantu speakers? Um, the I, 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 missed, I, missed part of what you, I missed part of what you said. They're what kind of speakers? Um, Bantu speakers. Oh, now that part I'm not aware of. Okay. Um, I, I don't have. I, I can't respond to that because I'm not enough of a linguist. Because I always thought the, the Bantu language was was somewhat later, but I'm not going to. Uh, but then it it would have come out of a shall we say a parent language anyway, mm -hmm. and I'm just not enough of a linguist to comment on that. So I think I will not, you know, have anything to say about um, their relationship to the Bantu. That just not something that I feel qualified to talk about. Definitely, definitely. And, um, you know, there's another, um, you know, contention or there's something that's also been asserted with Insider as well, um, that the ancient Egyptians uh, never believed in a god, per se, but it was rather uh, deifications of principles and sciences and uh, nature. Um, is it possible to speak upon the differences between... Uh, uh, a god and a personification of uh, natural sciences. Okay, well, wait a minute. Uh, the, again, there's part of what you said that didn't come through. They never believed what? Uh, they never, in, they never, they never believed. in gods. Um, they never had a concept of god. Um, you know, this is something that's oh, been. I mean, I mean, I don't understand. I don't understand where these ideas come from. <laughs> if you look at, I mean, it, you know, even a casual. Uh, this uh, a casual um, reading of the religion of the ancient Egyptians, what they believed, uh, just you couldn't possibly take that attitude. You couldn't possibly think that. In fact, they talked about the creator, the one, the thing that created everything, as Wa, W A or U A, and the Wa means literally the one, and that all the Netters were powers and principles. Netters, what you call deities, were powers and principles of the one. And that idea, that di that divine idea, uh, and w in which they were given, um, in which they were I identified them as their various net terrors, whether it be Osiris and Isis and Thoth and um, uh, Newt uh, and Anubis, they are powers and principles of the One. The the best person to one of the best uh, works on that. Is to read the the uh, books of Schwalder de Lubish, R. A. Schwalder de Lubish. He really explains that quite thoroughly and, and in a way that just removes any doubt about that. But they did have a concept of the one deity. And then the other thing too is your Ju your Judaism and Christianity. Where do you think that came from? The Hebrews spent 450 years in Egypt. And then when you look carefully at their religion, you realize it was brought out with them. From Egypt. Now they modified it over the years afterward, but fundamentally it came out of an Egyptian foundation. Christianity as much, if not more. Mm -hmm. And I even talk about that. I even discuss that in my book, The Echoes of Dark, Old Dark Land. I have two chapters, one on, one on the Old Testament, one on the New Testament, just detailing how that happened. Wow, wow. And if we would like to actually purchase um, any of your literature, especially this book that you're mentioning now, uh, where could we actually find it? Well, I am, uh, I am um, uh, just trying to decide whether I'm going to bring a box of books with me. I probably will, so I'll, I'll have some books with me. Uh, so um, that would be probably the, the most immediate way to get hold of the books. I'll probably be able to bring about 50 of them or so. Uh, Anyway, that's that's the most immediate way of getting getting hold of them. Excellent. And for those of you who don't know, um, we've got Dr. Charles Finch. He's actually uh, flying over to the UK and doing uh, uh, several sets of lectures and workshops in the UK starting on uh, Thursday the 17th, uh, leading all the way up to the 20... 
seventeenth to the twenty twenty third. Um, so if you would like to get um, any tickets or uh, anything like that, I'm actually going to put the information at the bottom of uh, this particular uh, page, which is in the description box. Just go into the description box, uh, look down, and you'll find it in there. You'll find the number, and you'll find other information that will link you in uh, to purchase your tickets and the days, etc., that we're going to actually be hosting uh, Dr. Charles Finch in the UK. So uh, can't wait for that. The one um, person who has made all this happen more than anyone is Amonet Hall. Um, she has been indefatigable in making this happen. I even told her you should call these the Amonet Lectures because she has worked uh, just you know, unceasingly to make this happen. So she's the one. And she knows everything about my schedule and everything else. So that's Amonet Hall of the Blue Water family. That's right. Um, she has been very um, wonderful to actually work with and to set all this up. So um, shout-outs to our sister, Amonette Hall, and hopefully we're going to get her on a little bit later on, uh, you know, to just talk a little bit for us. I uh, hope she isn't uh, too shy to be on the screen or on camera right now. Um, so, yes, um, Dr. Charles Finch, actually, you know what? I, I need to ask you this question. Um, how was it actually meeting uh, the late, great, uh, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema and uh, also Dr. Ben Yakanen. The one, okay, I, I knew, I, okay, the, I, let me tell you the ones I knew the best, had the most interaction with. I Yes, I met and knew uh, Dr. Joseph Ben Yakanen. Uh, the ones, though, I had the most interaction with was one with Ivan Van Sertema and the other was Sheikh Anta Jope, right? Now, Sheikh Anta Jope to me was a, you're talking about a titan. Uh, he was a, practically a, a, a scholarly demagogue. Now, that's my personal opinion, uh, uh, like a, almost like a demagogue to me. I almost think he could easily be considered maybe the, 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 the supreme African uh, scholar in the African world for the 20th century. You, you know, people talk about W.B. Du Bois and a few others. Yes, perhaps, but he's one of them. He's right up there in that pantheon. And then Ivan Van Sertema, well, he was a, he was a personal friend. He was also someone... Uh, with whom I published my first eight articles I ever published. I published with Ivan Van Sertema. I was on. A, I was in fact I was on the podium on the on the uh, the podium with him in in London actually back in 1989. No, I'm sorry, it wasn't even that late. It was like 87, 88. Um, and I and I shared uh, the panel with him several times. He was also at the Nile Valley Conference that we hosted here in Atlanta in 1984, and he published the proceedings. Uh, of the, the Nile Valley Conference. And so uh, they came before Columbus was his signature work. And equally as important were the 20 uh, issues of the Journal of African Civilizations, which were anthologies on African civilizations. And uh, they have continued to exert a tremendous impact and influence on scholars, um, me in particular, and many, many others. And so, as I say, he, he left his imprint. No doubt he had, was joked, certainly. And Van Sertema left a marked imprint, um, you know, on the, shall we say, on African and African-American letters. Let's put it like that. Many, many people, more, there are other people who knew Dr. Ben Duconin much better than I did. And they can uh, tell you, um, um, uh, I can get something out of here it's in my way. I don't know why it's doing that. Uh, uh, could, you could maybe interview them, and they can give you a much better, shall we say, response about his importance to them. Uh, I knew him, but I did not know him well. And uh, but I knew Van Sertema very well, and I got to know Sheikh Anta Job well as well. Also, great. And I know you're in uh, Georgia. You're in uh, Georgia. Georgia, Atlanta. Yeah, Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and I know. Um, Recently, oh, um, there was the 33rd year, the third of year ASCAC anniversary. ASCAC anniversary. Yes. Annual anniversary. Annual anniversary. Yes. Um, have you? Were you able to participate uh, in? Uh, you able to participate the, in uh, yes. Yes. I was uh, actually. I gave the uh, key. I gave the kickoff uh, lecture on Thursday night. Uh, <clears throat> they wanted me to talk about the Benu Study Group. The Benu Study Group was a study group that was organized in Atlanta, 1982. Uh, I was in that study group. Obadiah Williams was in that study group, and um, Asa Hilliard, Asa Grant Hilliard, was another person who was in the study group. Also, Askia Muhammad Toure. These are names that other people might know. We were very 
we were, we weren't very big. There was only seven or eight of us, but we were the we organized two things. We organized the Nile first Nile Valley Conference in Atlanta. That was in September of 1984, and then after that, we uh, were instrumental along with Lawrence Carter of the um, King Chapel at Morehouse College in bringing Shake On to Joe to, to, uh, to the United States for the very first time in April of 1985, as I've already mentioned, where he got his only uh, honorary degree in the whole world. Can you imagine? He had, nobody else in his entire life gave him an honorary degree until Morehouse College did in 1985. So the Better Study Group was uh, uh, deeply involved in both events, and um, and they, they had me come and talk about that era uh, between 1982 and 1986 uh, at the uh, ASCAC. I couldn't get to the rest of the ASCAC program because of the press of other business, and also I wasn't feeling well. I've uh, been having a, I'm just only now recovering from a bronchitis, and so that kept me from uh, getting back to uh, some of the other activities that were going on. Um, but yes, I did go to, I did, uh, was there at the, at the kickoff, you might say, at the launch of the, uh, uh, of the program. And it's supposed to have been, well, it's supposed to have been very well attended. 300 people at least showed up. Um, so uh, I think it went off very well. Definitely, definitely. I've actually been uh, watching or uh, been viewing the pictures, the images um, of the event. We had, uh, you know, members of the Amon Ra squad, um, such as uh, Asaim Hotep, uh, Sun Jedi, um, Ujau, uh, Anka Kek, all of these great uh, names and scholars actually attend uh, the ASCAC lecture and potentially and possibly I believe Asaim Hotep may have actually given a presentation um, but don't hold me to that I'm just looking at the images and I'm seeing them it's absolutely amazing to see this is now in its 33rd cycle um, you know what you yourself actually uh, you know, kicked off your, um, you know, your vocal scholarship based upon uh, your outreach to um, Sheikh Anta Diop. Was it Sheikh? No. Yes. Yeah, Sheikh Anta Diop and him actually uh, contacting you back. You know, not, not a lot of these things actually take place nowadays. We have so much young, um, you know, enthusiastic, budding uh, researchers and scholars. Um, but there seems to be a a, a disjoint um, between the elder generation, the elder scholars, and the new young scholars uh, coming up. How do you think we could best, um, you know, reconnect with the elders, and uh, the elders actually help and guide the pens of uh, these new scholars, and to actually just spark them off? I can only tell you what I, what I, and people like Roko Rashidi did, and one or two others. We didn't wait for them to come to us; we went to them. We went to Ivan Van Sertima. You know, we either wrote him or called him. We went and met Sheikh Anta Jope. Uh, we met. I met John G. Jackson, who we actually I actually brought to Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, met uh, John Henry Clark. So, in other words, we did not wait for that it to happen. We made it happen. And the only way, uh, as you call it, well, let me just say, if the younger scholars are going to, as you say, make that connect. They're going to have to take the initiative. I mean, that's uh, we will, you know. In some ways, you don't even know who's out there doing work. Uh, that was true uh, in in certain cases where uh, people didn't know who I was 30 or 40, 35 years ago until one I started publishing with Van Sertima, and I had to make that first contact with Ivan Van Sertima to, to make that happen. So there's a certain amount of initiative that has to be taken by, as you call them, the younger scholars. And uh, that is going to be, I mean, I'm only talking from my experience, that's going to be the most effective way to make that, to uh, make that link. Definitely, definitely. So I hope, uh, you know, our younger scholars out there, please listen to our elders. Um, please try to contact them, reach um, out to them as well. They are literally a fountain house of wisdom. I was actually with Renoka Rashidi a few months back, and uh, <laughs> the amount of stories uh, this man has got to actually offer us, uh, you know, offer to me personally was absolutely amazing, you know, driving with him, uh, sitting with him in his hotel and, you know, telling me all the stories of, you know, Dr. Ben, uh, John Henry Clark, GM Jackson, etc., etc. It was absolutely amazing uh, and very much so inspiring as a young researcher and scholar myself. Uh, you know, it, it's good to actually have the elder generation um, 
you know, imparting their wisdom onto you. Okay, um, so I'm going to move on right now. Um, I just like to shout out um, the Blue Water family, and if you would like to actually um, get in contact with uh, the team that is actually running the tour for uh, Dr. Charles Finch, um, you can find them on uh, bluewaterfamily dot wordpress dot com. I will repeat that is www dot bluewaterfamilywordpress dot com, and the tour is actually taking place from the seventeenth of uh, this month. Uh, this is the Thursday to the twenty third of March two thousand and sixteen. That's if you're in the UK and you want to take part, uh, please visit that uh, website and uh, yeah, tune in definitely, definitely tune into that. Okay, um, Doctor Finch, please. I want you know what. I would love for you to start on uh, the cosmic shift and the equinox. Um, you know, I was actually watching one of your lectures to do with the Dogons, and uh, you know, so I just want to go right into the celestial right now. I want to go right up there. So if you could give us some information um, on that, that would be absolutely amazing. Well, I think the thing that the, yeah, this is a subject that I talk about quite a lot, as you can imagine. It's a uh, <clears throat> um. <clears throat> You got to understand what what was accomplished. Uh, you had like four calendars made, created. There was a calendar based on the moon. I'm talking about ancient <clears throat> ancient Africa, especially ancient Kemet. There is a solar calendar, the one that we know, all right. And then there was uh, the the Syrian calendar, the calendar uh, based on the heliacal rising of Sirius, uh, which was 1,460 years. And then there was this um, great year calendar of 26,000 years created by the fact that the Earth tilts from vertical at 23 and a half degrees. And that means there are two axes of the Earth. There's the vertical axis, straight up and down. Okay. Then there's the tilted axis, which we call the magnetic pole. And because it's tilted at 23 and a half degrees, as the Earth rotates and revolves around the Sun, it also that pole also gyrates. It gyrates around the... the uh, what do you want to call it, that uh, vertical axis, uh, so that you have the tilted axis rotating, revolving slowly around the vertical axis, North Pole. We call the, the you know, the, these are the, this is the polar axis I'm talking about, okay? The North Pole, the magnetic North Pole revolving around the North Pole, the ecliptic, or the vertical North Pole. That takes 26,000 years to complete. This was discovered by, in ancient times in Africa, hmm, maybe 52,000 years ago, all right? Um, certainly, okay, let's be a little bit more conservative because we're about through one and a half cycles of the great year. That would have been 39,000 years ago at least, okay? Let's, let's, uh, we can stay with that conservative. But you see, when they discovered this phenomenon, what they did is like what they have did when they first made the calendar. They divided it into 12 arcs. And in each arc, um, they, they put a, a constellation, a constellation which they uh, gave a name, a spirit, a mythology to, a uh, kind of an essence that reflects cosmic energies that are mediated through the, 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 the arc that the constellation rules. Now, each constellation stays in, uh, <clears throat> okay, how do they determine this? Well, we're coming up on it, in fact as you mentioned. Um, the first day of the, uh, of the coming equinox, if you, if you happen to go outside right before dawn and it's clear, you will see a constellation rising right before the sun. That is the constellation of Pisces. Pisces has been rising right before the sun for about 2,140, 30 years. And that's why we're in the age of Pisces. Okay? But in <clears throat> 2039, Pisces will stop rising right before the sun, and Aquarius will take its place. And so that will mean the end of the age of Pisces and the beginning of the age of Aquarius, which will go on for another 2,160 years. All right? Now, Aquarius was originally not the water man. In ancient Egyptian terms, Aquarius was Hathor Nut, the goddess of the waters. So you have an age coming up, which is the age of the great mother or the great goddess of the waters in 23 years. 23 years. Now, 
these ages that you know the, the, these are real phenomena. They're not just talking about what well, they say. Are you talking about astrology? Not exactly. We're talking about cosmic effects, cosmic forces, cosmic powers that impact the galaxy, impact the solar system, impact Earth, and impact everything on Earth. All right. Now, what the ancients did is that they were able to, shall we say, monitor these energies. Look at, you know, perceive what they were, understand them. I mean, after untold eons of observation. So each age itself has a special essence. And they knew that. They had developed that. And this is the reason why each, this, oh, and let me say one other thing. Let me get, when one age transitions to another age, there's a period where Everything that had come before begins to break down. As I was saying to somebody, I forget who I was saying this to, it's that famous uh, phrase by W. B. Uh, uh, William Butler Yeats. Uh, um, things, uh, center cannot, uh, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. And this is what happens to the world. As the old order has to make way for the new order. And this is cosmically determined. This is not anything human beings control. Human beings like to think they control everything. They don't control hardly anything, really. All right? Now, there's actually two great years. There's one determined by the 12 um, signs of the, equi uh, 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 of the equi um, of the what we call the, the, the zodiac, and there's seven constellations around the North Pole. Okay? Now, <laughs> so that means they're, and it's, it's determined by the exact same thing. It's, it's 26,000 years. It's 26,000 years around the equator, and it's 26,000 years around the North Pole because it's the same phenomenon that creates it, okay? It's the same tilt of the axis that revolves around the vertical axis, and whether you are measuring it by watching what uh, arises at the equinox or whether you're measuring it by w uh, what sign, it, what constellation is coming to the, uh, North Pole or the uh, magnetic North Pole is the same phenomenon. Ah, this is where it gets interesting because this is the only time in 26,000 years when two ages are shifting off and two ages are shifting in within 11 years of one another. The first age is the, what I talked about was the age of Aquarius. Pisces is moving off, Aquarius is moving in. And it'll stay there for 2,160 years at the equinox, right before the rise of the sun. But in the North Pole, what is the where does the magnetic North Pole point to? It points points to Ursa Minor, which is a little bear. However, um, the ancient Egyptians didn't call it the little bear; they called it the jackal. Wepwat the jackal, the uh, uh, opener of the way, or Anubis. All right. So that's the you have to go to those old archetypes and kind of get an idea of what what's really what's what's, what's really going on. But Anubis, uh, that what what jackal Anubis uh, started inhabiting the pole. I think six, one. Uh, I got to think about this. One one thousand six hundred fifty three B.C. or thereabouts. Whether that's actually accurate or not, one thing for sure. In let me see twenty thirty nine twenty fifty. There's going to be a new constellation at the North Pole of the magnetic North Pole. So that means a whole new age is starting there too. You get it? Two ages coming, going off, and two ages coming together within 10 years? No wonder the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Now, the question you need to ask yourself, or one needs to ask oneself, what is that constellation coming to the North Pole and will rule for 37 centuries? Ah, its name is Kepheus. And you can see it, by the way. You can. I'm, you, know, you don't have to take my word for it. You can see these things. You, you in the next what four or five days, you can go and if, the, if it's clear, get up before the sun rises and go out and watch Pisces arising right before the sun does. You can see that, and you can also see Kepheus is in the northern heaven, getting ready in about uh, 33 years, something like that. I'm sorry, I can't. 31 years, 2050, whatever that is. That's what 34 years. Coming to the North Pole, but who is Kepheus? Kepheus was... is the oh. Ethiopian king, mm. or I call him the cosmic Ethiopian king. That's right. Hmm. That's right. <laughs> That's right. 
There are three signs of his coming. You got some. You got some. You got some Rastafari in your audience. Uh, come on, because they're gonna like this. Yeah, we do. We do. The first sign of his coming. The first sign of his coming was the coronation of Haile Selassie in 1933. The second sign of his coming was the so-called Million Man March in 1995. The third sign of his coming was none other than the election of Barack Hussein Obama in 2008. There are always signs. Always there are signs. Mm, the Ethiopian king. I love that. I absolutely love that. Mm -hmm. love that. I absolutely love that. And you know what? Um, and you know what? Um, another thing as well. Another please, thing as well. Audience members out there, if you can, um, give us a big thumbs up if you're loving the information that you're hearing so far. Just give us a big like. Let us know that you're liking the information. And uh, please um, share this link. Share this link. Share it on your Google, your Facebook, your Twitters, um, you know, your Reddit, everywhere possible. Please share this link because uh, it's not too often that we, we get these living legends, uh, you know what, on the show, on Talk of the Titans, or on any show in general, uh, to actually give us these breakdowns that we don't normally hear anywhere else. So please, um, please hit the share button and get all your friends um, involved with this conversation. And of course, I'm going to open up the links, a link a little bit later on in the show where you can ask uh, Dr. Finch any question you like pertaining to the subjects uh, that he's, uh, well, spoken about so far. Um, don't, forget, don't forget to get in touch with Amanet. A Blue Water, don't forget to get in touch with Blue Water family too. That's he right. Is, he's the one in charge of everything that's going to happen from the 17th to the 23rd. Blue Water family, just you know, go to Google it, go to the website, uh, that's that's what has to be done. Indeed, indeed. All right, and you know what? Um, I, I have to ask you about this as well. Um, you know, there is obviously the equinox that's taken place. Um, you know, in ancient Egypt, there was uh, the uh, helical rising of Sirius uh, that took was I think is roughly taking place now um, in August, roughly between the fifth and the uh, eighth or ninth. Um, <clears throat> my nose is a bit blocked. Sorry, family members. Um, you know, what, what should we be doing on these momentous days? Like, what? How do we mark these occasions? Uh, what should we do to prepare ourselves and to align ourselves to these cosmic energies? All right. First of all, you gotta you, 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 uh, know when they're going to happen, and uh, it's a good time to sit somewhere quiet, um, 2, 3 a.m. in the morning, 4 a.m., no later than, 5 at most. Sit quietly, empty your mind, and let your ancestors and these cosmic powers speak to you, because they will. They're always trying to speak to you, you know. Your ancestors in particular, but also the cosmic powers that determine our destiny are trying to always speak to us, but whenever they try, they get a bit, it's like, calling and getting a busy signal because our minds are all filled with all this cacophony of noise, mental noise, oral noise, verbal noise. So that's the reason why you empty your mind, you quiet your mind so that you can, and, 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 and at the, that time of night or early morning when the world is asleep, then you can get messages. Yes, indeed, especially the women, especially the women. And also pay attention to your dreams especially the women. The women are the dreamers. Yeah. Pay attention to your dreams. Great stuff. Don't don't just don't just throw them away. That's those those are messages from the those are messages from the cosmos. Good. All right. Um, you know, before we actually go in uh, to the next uh, you know, step in the presentation, I would just love to just draw everybody's attention, actually. Um, if you're actually new to Talk with the Titans, uh, Talk with the Titans were birth, was birthed out of the idea that the intellectual giants, um, the intellectual giants, sorry, if everybody could just mute their mics, um, 
the intellectual giants, the titans of the community will have a well-organized uh, place or platform to present information, discuss information, and debate information that's affecting our community, proposed by you, our audience members out there, the community. Um, and also, if you please uh, check out the rest of uh, Talk with the Titans or the Titans TV, um, you know, we have... Uh, past shows. We've had uh, Rabbi Ro Harry Rosenberg, who will be debating uh, Polite come March the 20th. Um, and um, yeah, we've also had uh, Zion Lex on, uh, Sarah Su and Seti, who else? Uh, Team Osiris, uh, Armin Ra Squad, um, Red Pill, Blue Pill, sorry, Red Pill, uh, Orishas. Uh, this is the uh, Babalao and the Apetebi who came in and uh, gave us a wonderful breakdown of the Orishas and what is Aoife, as well as uh, Gano Grills as well. And, and if you like the debates that takes place, we've got tons of debates that takes place um, every single week. We post up information, uh, Speaker's Corner, where is a place that we have freedom of speech and you know we have all different types of uh, ideologies and backgrounds coming together to debate uh, from Muslims to um, atheists to Christians uh, to comedic practitioners to Jews to uh, Sikhs, uh, all different types of people come together and debate. And if obviously, if you uh, you know like that information, uh, please check that side of our channel out. Uh, if you want to hear more of my personal information or personal works, um, we've got me over here. Another playlist, which is uh, the Calamel playlist. We've got the 42 Negative Confessions. That is me reading uh, the uh, the the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Papyrus of Anui. And uh, this is the uh, Medonetta itself and breaking it down into the English. And we've got me debating at Speaker's Corner, uh, talking about whether Muhammad is black or white, uh, comedic rituals, so that's prayers, uh, Moses found in Egypt, and so forth and so forth. Uh, so please check that out. And we've also got a, a show that's dedicated to the women as well. So if any ladies on here that would love to talk about, um, you know, secular information or uh, social issues and current affairs as well as culture. Uh, we've got a show called Trending Topics and we discuss all these uh, different things as well. So please um, check out the different playlists on Talk with the Titans, uh, Titans TV, uh, to see more about what we do. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, Dr. Finch, um, if you could give us some more information actually on the um, African origins of science. How did the Africans uh, develop science and take it to the next level? Yeah, well, in Africa, science is both, you, you're talking about, uh, uh, you're talking about things that are both visible and in What happens in a place like Kemet and other places is that the invisible knowledge comes first, all right? And the invisible knowledge is never, what's the word? It's never supplanted. It is never uh, 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 shunted aside. And it, you might say, informs or gives rise to the external uh, uh, arenas of science. And let's just let's talk about architecture. Architecture wasn't just to build beautiful buildings. Architecture, if you look at those fabulous temples, was were created to literally um, channel energy to the sanctuary and also provide literally a home for the god, the deity, or the netters. Because the netters live in those places. They live in those temples. They were there and they lived and operated in those temples, so those temples had to conform to really specific criteria of development. They had to be built with certain kinds of stone, they had to be built according to certain orientations to the heavenly bodies, they had to be um, constructed in a certain way so that they could literally become homes of the God. That's just the architecture itself, okay? And so the architecture was enlivened by this um, the, by the spiritual essence of, of these practitioners so that an architect wasn't just somebody who built, he, he also was an adept. He was a spiritual adept. And why have mathematics? Mathematics in particular does what? It enables um, one to, uh, especially applied mathematics, 
and this is the reason why for the ancient Egyptians, mathematics was always geometry. It was always geometry, all right? And this is why geometry developed there first. Not just geometry, geometry, trigonometry, and I even have evidence that calculus developed there first. Because that became the tools by which they created um, these uh, spiritual, religious, and scientific edifices. They called it, they called their uh, their they often called their um, uh, temples peronk, which means house of life. And so, uh, one of the other things that it was, it was a place of healing. It was a place that people came for the healing work, for the healing power of the deity, god or goddess. So that's the other reason why the construction of the temples had to conform very exactly and minutely to certain uh, criteria, certain parameters, certain measurements. And they had to be built in with certain kinds of stone. And they had to be oriented in a certain way to channel all that energy coming from the cosmos as part of, part of the healing work. So the healing work, the architectural work, the mathematical work, the scientific work were all interwoven. All right? Um, and the, the, the spiritual work. So the priests had to be scientists and mathematicians and vice versa. The mathematics and the architecture, therefore, was informed, you might say, by the, 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 the spiritual mission of all of Egypt, of all of Kemet. Okay? Uh, and so they, um, so their investigations into math and science weren't just empirical, that is, just uh, developing theorems and equations and uh, um, methodologies. It was a out. It was a product of their investigations into the spiritual nature of the universe itself, in which they traveled out there, not with spaceships. The Dogon people of Kemet, they didn't travel out there in spaceships. They, the ancient Egyptians uh, had a concept they called the Ka, which was the um, the double or the energy body. And the Ka <clears throat> and the dreaming body was that aspect of your, that's why I talk about dreaming, that could be controlled volitionally in such a way that you could actually move out beyond any, uh, shall we say, restrictions here on Earth and into the cosmos and actually do research out there, investigations. That's what they did. So did the Dogon, by the way. That's how they knew what they knew. You say, how do they know so much about the cosmos? Because they went out there and they investigated, and they didn't need spaceships to do it. So you can see, we're not talking about um, an ideas, ideas, mentalities, uh, methodologies that we understand today. We've lost that. Okay? So when we go out into space, we build spaceships to do it. And we don't learn any more than those ancients did, who, while their physical bodies were here on Earth, actually could explore space and did, the farthest reaches of the universe. And they did. Now, you know, I'm not asking anybody to believe that, but the, the proof is in, what am I say, the, their constructs what they were able to put together, what they were able to do. And did they meet other beings out there? They most assuredly did. Oh, yes. There's, the universe is populated by sentient beings. We're not the only ones out there with brains and a mind. Okay? So, um, and did they exchange information? Oh, yes. Sure they did. Still not the same as saying that the uh, that E.T. had to come in and build the pyramids for them. As, you know, the, the, to, to uh, acknowledge a interaction with uh, cosmic beings is not the same thing as saying that those beings came and just set everything up in the civilization. And I, I reject that uh, categorically. Definitely. So you got to understand, therefore, there is a spiritual dimension, an uh, energetic dimension, an empirical dimension and a physical dimension, not separate. All because you know you know what they could do in their dreams? They could actually take their physical bodies and merge it with their dreaming bodies and actually make those voyages. 
I know I'm talking, but you know, I mean, we don't we, we don't understand all of that. We don't understand that, and yet mm. this is what happened. So you know, what would you say to you know a lot of people? Um, I know there's a there's a bit of a feedback, uh, Doctor Finn. Is it possible for you to mute your mic? Um, and your image is has become still. I can see my image moving, but you say you can't. No, I can't at the moment. If you if it's possible, just press the right click button and press reload. Right click and reload, and hopefully you'll come back in again. I I see the reload. Okay, I'm doing that. Okay. So we're gonna have Dr. Charles Finch come back in again. I'm gonna ask him the question because you know what I know a lot of my uh, you know family members out there, uh, you know, they they think uh, you know they kind of neglect or reject the spiritual realm or the spiritual aspect of things, and uh, you know. I don't know. I don't know. What do you think about the whole uh, thoughts of astral projecting? Uh, you know, allowing your spirit to see things that your physical body can't possibly uh, perceive and conceive. Can we bring back spiritual information into the physical realm itself? Or do you think that this is completely, um, you know, unrealistic um, and fantastic? So I'm actually going to ask this question to Dr. Charles Finch now. I, I believe he's back. Um, I don't know if you're. There you go. Yes, you are back with us. Excellent. Um, so yes, okay. Dr. Charles Finch. Um, what do you think about the people that uh, completely negate uh, the spiritual aspect of um, of the world and only? Uh, I, I don't. This... I, I just don't have a time for that argument. Mm. It just it's just so uh, completely fantastic that they that they that they're people who don't have any sense. Uh, of the spiritual dimension of existence, because that is the real place where existence takes place. You know, the uh, the physical dimension is kind of what we call, I like this word, an epiphenomenon. You know, is a, uh, what do you want to say? It is a, a side effect of the spiritual world. Now, if you don't know that, then there's no, nothing, I, I can't, we can't talk. And I can't, I can't, what's the word? I can't, um, I'm not going to try to uh, convince you. You either know it or you don't know it. And yet it's all around you. It's in you. Every time you go to sleep, every time you have an intuition, every time you dream, you're just ignoring the, the truth and the reality of a dimension that is the real. That's where reality really is. And uh, so I don't know that I can even get into that conversation because I have no, no patience for it, quite honestly. <laughs> and especially, um, especially, I know you yeah, are a, you are a um, member, um, member initiate um, um, of um, the of West the African traditional uh, practice or spiritual practice. I believe um, Mami Wata. So could and, the you, and the Vodou also. And the Vodou also. Um, you know, could you just uh, talk us through your experience of uh, you know joining this uh, you know ancient culture and society and the uh, the. Look the wonderful information and, uh, it, they, and wisdom they, it departs all I, all I can tell you, All I can tell you is they came looking for me. And, um, and when and they came looking for me, I did not resist. And in doing so, uh, and I'm a little unusual in one way. There aren't that, uh, if, if you take a hundred Mami Wata practitioners, hundred, any hundred of them, let's just take a hundred. And more you can multiply them. There are 40 million actually, but let's just take any hundred of them. Only five of them are men. So I'm a little I'm a little unusual in that way. There aren't that many male Mamiwata devotees. I'm one. Um, and um, you know, people have this. You know, if you go online and read about Mamiwata, they have there's a very strange thing they say about her. They say that uh, she uh, is she is to be feared. She brings disease. If you go into water, she drowns you. And I'm, I actually go and I talk, and I I I I talk to mommy. I said, mommy, I don't I don't uh, I don't um, I don't recognize this mommy they're talking about. She says, well, you got to understand what people project onto me. That's what they get. If they project fear, if they re if they project all of these negative impulses. On Mami Wata, or not just Mami Wata, any of them, any of the great powers of Africa, what you—that's what you're going to get back. I don't. I have none. That has never been. 
my attitude or feeling. I don't have any feeling about that whatsoever, so I don't get that at all. I don't even I say I don't even recognize that when people say that. So mommy is the great mother of the waters. And yes, she is with me and she protects me and she protects mine. She protects my family too. I remember back in uh, 1989, as I was beginning to get interested in traditional African spirituality, I just said it to the universe. I didn't know anything. I said, um, I will do this and I will be faithful to it, but you have to protect my family. And you know what? They have. And they're real. They're more real than we are. And I'm not asking anybody to believe it. I don't really care whether anybody believes it um, or not. Uh, either you know it or you don't know it. You feel it or you don't feel it. She's real to you or, or they, the other Vodou, they are real to you or they aren't. And um, I, I, it's not my job to convert. I'm not interested in conversion. I, I'm not a missionary. I, you know, if someone asks me, like you're asking me, I'll tell you. I'll tell you all about mommy. I'll tell you all about the Vodou. I was uh, initiated uh, in, by, in Togo by the Togolese, the Eve. So uh, they initiated not, not only Mami, but also the Vodou. I also might add Afa, which is the Togolese version of Ifa. So there it is. Not a secret. I don't make a, I don't make a point of talking about it, but if someone asks me, I do, I do respond. Wow. Wow. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely. You know what? I'm, 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 you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm really, privileged really privileged right now privileged to actually right now. Hear, this hear this information. And I believe my audience and members, my audience members are, are major in wonder, major right, wonder right, right, now. right now because I don't think they're no they 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 had this information before and part of it from one of our greats as yourself. Unfortunately, we do have the echo going on as well. But you know what? I'm going to allow you to go back into the presentation that you've got for us. I believe. We're on the third section talking about the um, African origins of culture and uh, how we, we, we birthed culture and civilization and the great wonders and gifts uh, we gave to the world, such as science and technology. So if you could um, give us some information on uh, the African origins of culture, that would be wonderful. Oh, boy. Hmm. <clears throat> well, you got to. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be kind of brief on this one because this really requires a more further, uh, what's the word, uh, explanation. And I think some of this I'm going to reserve for the presentations and workshops that I have coming up when I'm in the UK. Um, the first thing you want to, and I'm th this is as much as I'm going to say. The first thing that people need to realize is that when human beings first created societies and culture. They did it around what I call the motherhoods, what people call the matriarchy. We call it the matriarchy we want to, the motherhoods. And it stayed that way uh, until about six to 10,000 years ago, so that was about, oof. Uh, we don't even know how long that was. So even hum humanity's first concept of what was God or the deity was feminine. Now, Obviously, something's changed, right? Something has drastically changed. You look at all the major religions of the world, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, just the starters, all patriarchal, and the deities are all male. Didn't used to be that way. Now, <clears throat> the explanation for all of that is just not something that we can, we can really get into in the five or ten minutes that I have left this evening. But... Um, I would then ask your audience to get in touch with Amanette and, make, and she can tell you when I'm going to deal with that. In fact, I'm going to deal with that subject in two different workshops. So, um, and we will too. And um, what can I tell you? It will, be, it will be serious. A serious matter. And we will talk about how the patriarchy evolved out of the matriarchy. Okay? That's what happened. It evolved out of the matriarchy. Um, and the other thing you heard me mention, on the one hand, the great mother of the waters who we call Aquarius. That's one. And then we talked about the cosmic Ethiopian king. Well, this is one of the things that is happening in this century. You're finding, finally, that there's a kind of uh, equilibrium that is being established between matriarchy and patriarchy. Maybe for the first time in history, except in ancient Kemet. 
In ancient Kemet, they found that equilibrium. Almost nowhere else did they. And it's being real. And I think now what is happening, cosmically speaking, that equilibrium is being established. One other thing, you ought to read the books by uh, Car uh, Carlos Castaneda. Ten books uh, detailing his uh, apprenticeship with the Yaqui Indian sage Don Juan Matus. You know what Don Juan Matus said? He said that the universe, the whole universe, is about two thirds female. And I said, yeah, I said, whoa. I said, whoa. I mean, I mean, that requires some, what's the word? Some, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting tired, so I'm, I can't even come up with the word. That, that requires some rumination. That's what he said. And I didn't have any reason to disbelieve him. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so we, will, we will look at that. We will discuss these things um, beginning on, what's today? Two, what is today? I'm losing track. Today is Monday. I guess we start on uh, whenever the 17th is. Um, Thursday. No, no. Yeah, Wednesday. Uh -huh. Okay, so you know what? Let's you know what? the anti right now. Right now. Um, 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 if everybody could just move their, their mics real quickly. Real quickly. Okay. okay. Um, um, I'm going to invite our audience members, our panel members in uh, to actually ask uh, Dr. Charles Finch any questions. We only allow one burning question that you have. For yeah, you. please. One question. Short. We, don't, we don't need a whole, you know, that's the only problem with asking questions. People want to expand. Short questions, please. One. All right. So I'm going to... I'm actually going to start off um, with our panel members right now, and I'm actually going to open it up uh, for our audience members to ask their questions. Uh, so if anybody wants to ask their question, please uh, give me a signal, and then I'll put you straight in. Okay. Is that you, Brother Kondosu? Yes, Harry. sir. What's up, bro? How you feeling? I'm good. I'm good. How you doing, man? Yes, um, Dr. Finch, it's an honor to um, be able to speak with you, man. You've been very influenced, you know, and a big influence in my life um, as a scholar. And the question I have is, what is your opinion on the influence of the Adrinka um, people in physics? Because I've done some research and found that their symbols were early forms of physics or, or relative to. Yeah. What is your opinion? Uh, I uh, have no reason to doubt it because that's the thing about African symbolism. Uh, there's so little that we really know about it, quite honestly. There's, uh, there's so much more to it than uh, we are even giving. And I think that requires systematic study, not only just a few days or weeks or months over a period of years. I don't know enough about Adinkra to be able to give you a definitive answer, but yeah, I'd say that there are aspects of it that could relate to the development of theoretical physics. Um, but uh, if you were asking me, okay, give me examples, I couldn't. I just don't know Adinkra well enough to be able to answer in that way, but I kind of uh, agree with that assessment, actually. But I can't say more than that, really. Interesting question, though. Made me uh, make me so make go back and 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 study the Adenkra a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. And that was our brother Konsu from Team Osiris. Team Osiris on the horizon. Um, so anybody else who has a question who is right here right now, please just give me a signal and I'll put you straight in. Okay. Um, I'm gonna let our brother Shesmu go in and then brother Harry. Yes, indeed. Can you hear me clearly? I can, yes. Yes, sir. First of all, first and foremost, I ditto what um, Brother Kansu said. Um, your um, knowledge and information over the years has uh, influenced me as well. Um, and I appreciate you. And Kalam, you have done it again. Um, you have truly brought a titan to the show. Um, we, uh, much respect and honors to you, um, Dr. Finch, and to you also, Kalam. Um, my question would be, um, do you think um, that the Dogon, I know, um, you know, 
when I uh, uh, heard some lectures and, and got some information, you spoke about the Dogon having keen eyesight at night, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And do you think that they had the possible or possibly had um, technology like telescopes, they or do you it. think they were? No, they didn't okay. need it. I, I already said, I already, I already referred, I already kind of made a reference to it. They right, had right, right. Their, they had perfected their energy bodies and dreaming bodies to such an extent because they deliberately isolated themselves in the along the Bandiaga cliffs in Mali, uh, away from uh, the possibility of conquest, that they could make forays into the universe that way, and they did. That's how they know so much. Understood. They did not need the technology. That's the whole point. They did not need telescopes. They did not need telescopes. The only technology they had was let's call it the, their spiritual technology or their energetic technology, and they had refined it and, and developed to such an extent they literally could make forays into the universe. I'm not saying they're the only people who could do that, but they certainly right. were one of those who could do that. And that's right. what they did. That's the only way you can explain, if you read the book The Pale Fox, the only way you can explain their knowledge. You can't explain it any other way. Understood. And lastly, um, and what would be the... Um, what would be the um, Timeline, like timeline, we, we talk like about, we, we talk about thousand years. years. Um, what what is the true uh, timeline? Is it six thousand? Is it twelve? I mean, six for um, seeing like the constellation revelate. You know, the revelatory um, oh. changes over these period. Oh, you know, 26, timeline. Twenty six thousand years. And now the question is: did the ancients did the ancients actually watch for twenty six thousand years before they arrived at the uh, arrived at the great year concept? I don't know. Is it impossible? No. But if you were going to observe that, you would have to observe it for 26,000 years. Either that or they either that or they found a way of calculating it. Now if you ask which did they do, I don't have an answer for that. But okay. they knew it. My God, they knew it. Going back a minimum of 39,000 years and maybe back to 52,000 years. I mean, it, it boggles the so mind. Much. Yeah. Check. Thank you so much. Kalan. Okay, great. Uh, that's my brother, Shazmi, right there. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Harry, Rabbi Harry Rosenberg, uh, to ask a question as well. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you uh, for addressing the scholar. A uh, quick question. Can you comment on the nature of the inside of the Great Pyramid, uh, what it was built with, and if that material has any uh, connection to electricity technology? Uh, I know there's a lot of theories out there. Well, <clears throat> I think the thing about the Great Pyramid is not only what it was built, because some of those, you know, on the outside, those uh, stones were like two and a half tons. But inside the King's Chamber, th those stones were like 60 tons uh, and built from uh, a certain kind, uh, a, a certain type of stone uh, quarry from the same place uh, in Aswan. Now, that stone was important, but it was also the, the actual construction, the actual configuration of what they call the King's Chamber and the Queen's Chamber and uh, those descending passages, ascending passages. Those, uh, they were actually constructed in a, in a certain way to achieve certain effects. I think, for example, and I, I'm only saying I think because there is some um, speculation about it, that there is a ton, there is a, a a passageway from the Sphinx to the Great Pyramid, and I think that the completion or the completion of initiation for a priest in ancient Egypt would have been in the Great Pyramid, and I, and so the the so-called sepulchre in the Great Pyramid in the King's Chamber, if you've ever been in there. It wasn't for mortal remains. If anything, it was for the symbolic and mythological death and resurrection of the postulant who was in the process of being initiated to the priesthood. And by the way, this is what was apparent to Trump. When you, you know, you were always tested in the, in, in, the, in the process of becoming a priest in ancient Egypt. You only had one chance. You failed it one time. That was it. You couldn't go any further. That was it. Forever, you had to you had to get it right that first time. That first time only, there were no second chances. Not for that, okay? But that was where the the Great Pyramid would have been, where the final what's the word um, initiation would have taken place, and the way the way it was constructed, the way it was put together, the as you say the stones, uh, and we don't know enough about 
the way in which they concentrated energy. They say pyramids concentrate energy. Yeah, um, and um, all of that uh, being the case, um, uh, all, we don't know enough. We think we know. I appreciate that. Uh, well, we think we know, but we don't really know uh, enough about the Great Pyramid. But I can say at least as much as I've said. Okay, I appreciate that because I was just under the uh, impression that there's a lining of quartz inside, and we know scientifically today, if quartz is vibrated at a certain frequency, it secretes electricity. So I was wondering if there was you know, a non-metaphysical narrative to the power that we're discussing that they were harnessed. There is. There always is. There always is. By the way, you know, I wasn't when. Uh, but I don't know about the quartz. I have not seen the quartz or heard about the quartz. I've been in the uh, King's Chamber many, several times. Uh, I haven't been to every particular chamber there is in the in the uh, pyramid, but um, there always is. What did you say? A non-metaphysical correlation, shall we say, to anything that might have been happening uh, in the non-physical or, or or energetic domain. There was there. Those things were never separated. They were always inter interconnected. So yeah, there's 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 nothing to suggest that didn't happen. Okay. Uh, I don't know where the quartz. Is. I don't know where the quartz is, quite honestly. Uh, I haven't well, seen it. I'm not 100% sure. I just we got to look into it. And just to my final statement, I appreciate your time. Is I don't know if this is is relevant, but you mentioned the kind of initiation in the priesthood. And now I noticed um, before there was someone speaking, Brother Kons Konsu. I don't know how to pronounce it exactly. And I saw the background of his picture. He had a, a, the all-seeing eye with a, a Freemasonic sign on it. And I wanted to know because you know there's the words initiation there. What what is the connection between those two, um, if any? Uh, the what the what the uh, uh, the all-seeing eye. Well, I mean, for that you have to go into masonry. Now masonry relates itself back to Hiram the. Uh, who was supposed to have uh, built the uh, oh, the Temple of Solomon for him. But it really did, goes back, if, you, if anything, to Imhotep. Now, I would have to have seen that. I would have to see the... Uh, I, I don't remember. I know what you're talking about, but I didn't really keep it in my eye. But the all-seeing eye, you know, that's that's the eye of Horus. That's the eye... That's, it's not only the eye of Horus, it's the eye of spiritual vision. And I think that's about as much as we can probably say about it at this moment. We'd have to kind of look at it more carefully and we'd have to go into it a little more carefully and I have more time than we really have to do at this time. Okay, well that's my that's my piece. All right, thank you. Um, and could I ask everybody who is, you know, already asked their questions uh, to, you know, please uh, remove themselves so other people who are trying to get in right now can actually get in and ask their dying questions because we're literally entering into the last two to five minutes of the show. Um, and um, we're, we're running out of time, and we need to just cut it back as, as much as possible. Um, so if anybody on the panel has any last dying questions to ask uh, Dr. Finch, uh, please ask it now. I'd like to ask a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, Robert, Robert Barval mentioned um, something about a steel plate and a ruler being found in the Great Pyramid, and the steel plates being held in, the I think, the basement of the of the British Museum for over a hundred years, and the rulers now turned up in the museum in Scotland. I think he mentions it in his one of his books, um, Black Genesis, and in one of his lectures. Do you know anything about that? Well, I know that there was uh, steel was actually found in the joints of one of the um, stone joints of the Great Pyramid, and. Uh, Egyptologists have sort of refused to acknowledge. They 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 are assuming that it was a, a late addition because steel was not supposed to have been able to be pre created at that time. Okay, but so what I'm the only thing you can say there is evidence that yes, steel was there at a much earlier time than uh, metallurgical history would allow, um, and. They didn't use steel that much, though. I mean, not that it was unknown, but they more likely used copper, for copper and bronze. I think because copper, someone was mentioned, you know, a conductor. Copper has certain properties, conductive properties and others, that uh, was more along the lines of what the ancient Egyptians used, needed it for. Um, but yes, uh, there is evidence of steel going back that far. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. And. Um,
again, um, I've literally put the link uh, to join in on the panel. So if you've got a question for Dr. Charles Finch, um, the link is actually in the description box. And if you will actually want to join us in the after show discussions that we normally do have, uh, we usually have other Titans joining it right at the end. Uh, it's just to have discussions at the end of the show. Um, if you'd like to join in, please uh, hit the link down below in the description box. Join us in right now and um, we can, you know, ask your question live on air. Um, and again, please, if you have um, the capacity to, please hit the share button that's usually down below somewhere. Um, share the link with your friends. Um, in invite your friends into to the conversation. Um, you know what? And let us know your thoughts on the presentation so far. Far the information that you've heard. Uh, you know, we've heard so many great things from the uh, African origins of science, technology, culture to the celestial uh, wheel in heavens with the twenty-six thousand years uh, jumping from one era to the next in terms of the spring equinox that uh, locates us within a certain uh, time and space within the universe and the uh the different, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, what do we call it now? The different houses, the 22,150 houses as well. So, you know, to let us know your comments on those types of issues that has been discussed so far. Um, we've yeah, now got Anka Keck from the Armand Ross squad who's just... Okay, Dr. Charles Finch? Yeah, I'm kind of coming to the end of my availability here. Okay. Um, because, uh, you know, I'm getting on a plane tomorrow night. That's right. To come there. That's right. And I've still got a lot to do between now and then. Um, and um, so I'm going to kind of uh, have to bring my part of it to the close. I do want to, to encourage people to visit my uh, website, charlessfinch.com. That's charlessfinch.com, real simple. Uh, I'm also on Facebook, tw uh, Twitter, and YouTube, and Pinterest, I'm told. So, you know, um, got various things going on in, in those on through those media uh, for anybody who might be interested. Definitely, um, we've literally uh, just we've had literally one of the greatest Titans and are uh, with us right now. If, if someone could just mute their mics because um, we're literally about to wrap up this um, segment of the show. We're going to have an after-show discussion, um, so please join us uh, if you're watching live right now uh, in the description box. Just go in the description box, hit the link, and you'll be in right now. And I'm going to please um, ask you to please uh, comment, uh, like. If you like the information, give us a big thumbs up and share the link so more people can see the information, hear the information, and learn from one of our greatest uh, titans with living legend that we have here with us right now. Um, you know, Dr. Charles Finch, it's been an absolute pleasure to actually have you and to host you um, right here on Talk with the Titans. I actually can't wait, um, you know, for when you land in the UK. Um, you know, I'm going to be with you from the very first day you land down. You know, I must already be carrying you from the... Um, <laughs> carrying you from wherever you are to wherever you need to go. So um, it's going to be an absolute pleasure to actually spend some time with you, to rub shoulders with you, and to learn much more um, from you as well. Um, and I'm going to give a big shout out to our Blue Water family, um, Amanet, uh, who's actually going to be hosting as well. Um, you know the the lectures and tours that's going to be taking place uh, from the 17th of uh, this month, March. Uh, that's the Thursday, all the way to the 23rd. Uh, there's going to be on the Sunday an equinox. Um, uh, gathering as well, which is going to be absolutely uh, phenomenal. Um, so please, if you want to get in touch uh, with the Blue Water family and you want to get uh, your tickets, if you're in the UK, uh, please, 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 please uh, visit the website. The website is www.bluewaterfamilywordpress.com. I'm definitely going to leave uh, that information in the link down below. Uh, Dr. Charles Finch, um, again, it's been an absolute pleasure um, having you on the show. If there's any last things that you, last message or announcement you would like to make, you know, uh, the floor is open to I you. Will, I will, my only last message is that I will see, I will see you soon. Okay, I'll see you soon as well. All right, so we're signing out. Uh, you've been watching Talk with the Titans with the living legend himself, Dr. Charles Finch, and I've been your host, Callum L, signing out. Peace.